Wow, today's show, it's a whopper. We dig into the genius and the tragedy that surrounded a pop music classic that was number one several times for two different artists. The co-writers of this song, uh, decimated by career and money struggles, they committed suicide. And the erratic artist recognized for recording the definitive version of this song, he tried everything he could to sabotage it. The details of this bittersweet rock and roll soap opera are coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you wanna rock and roll all night and party every day, this is your channel. Make sure to subscribe below right now. The stories of the greatest songs straight from the legends. Make sure to click the bell so you never miss out. Also, take a gander at our Patreon where you'll get exclusive content, full interviews, help us keep the music alive. It's one of the most powerful outcries of heartbreak ever recorded. Perhaps even more painful is the story of what ultimately happened to the co-authors of uh, the composition that became a masterpiece of human anguish. The song's destiny wasn't realized until a temperamental and relatively unknown artist happened to hear the original version at a party and, you know, became obsessed with recording his own version of the gripping ballad titled Without You. I guess that's just the way the story goes. Without You developed from the combination of two unfinished songs, one work in progress by Peter Ham, tentatively billed as If It's Love, and a chorus without verses by Tom Evans called I Can't Live. Peter Ham and Tom Evans were two principals in the quintet Badfinger. Now Badfinger was a very talented and very cool band, but they were largely underappreciated and systematically victimized by underhanded mismanagement and an imploding record label, Apple Records, uh, the record company owned by the Beatles. Badfinger first went by the moniker The Ivies and were the first non-Beatles act to land on a recording deal on Apple Records many of you probably know. They changed their name from the Ivies to Badfinger. That happened in 1969. The Fab Four, they loved Badfinger. Paul McCartney even took the guys under his wing, so to speak. Macca gave Badfinger their irresistible debut hit, Come and Get It, and produced the single that rose to number four in the UK and number seven on the Billboard Hot 100 in 1970. If you want it, here it is, come and get it. Badfinger would follow with the top 10 hit, No Matter What. No matter what you do. Their highest charting American single, Day After Day, that came next. It climbed to number four on the Billboard Hot 100 in 1971. Day after day. And their last hit single, Baby Blue, that pinked at number 14 in the US. That happened in 72. You probably heard Baby Blue in the series finale of the TV drama Breaking Bad in 2013. If you haven't seen that, you gotta check it out. Now, Pete Ham and his Bad Finger bandmates were bunking together with a band called the Mojos in a borough of London known as Golders Green. Uh, one evening in Golders Green, Ham and his girlfriend Beverly Tucker were set to go on a date. As they were leaving their flat though, Tom Evans told Ham he had an idea for a song. Ham explained to his friend that he couldn't stay because he'd promised Beverly a night out on the town. But Beverly didn't want her beau to be thinking about Evans' idea all night. So she told him she was fine with him going into the studio to work with Evans. Now Ham looked at his girlfriend and he uttered the line, your mouth is smiling, but your eyes are sad. That line was the start of a new song that Ham labeled, If It's Love. Ham continued to write the verses. Well, I can't forget tomorrow when I think of all my sorrow. I had you there, but then I let you go. And now it's only fair that I should let you know what you should know. Now it's only fair that I should let you know. It had the makings of a deeply emotional song, but it lacked a chorus. Meanwhile, Tom Evans had a chorus he'd written that needed verses. It uh, happened after Evan's future wife, Marilyn, had left him and he frantically traveled from London to Bonn, Germany to find her. In the midst of his despair, uh, he scrolled the chorus for a song, I can't live if a living is without you. I can't live, I can't give any more. The guys 
you know, they usually wrote separately, but this time it was a collaborative effort. The merger of Ham's verses and Evan's chorus turned the two unfinished songs into the heartbreaking sentimental ballad, Without You. Ham and Evans didn't think too much of Without You. Uh, in fact, it was the last cut to be added to their third studio LP, No Dice. They had no inkling of it being released as a single from the album at all. Bat Fingers Without You appeared to be buried as a deep cut, at the most, a hidden gem that only the uber Bad Finger fans would ever really know about. Later in 1971, some 5,400 miles away from Abbey Road, you know, where No Dice was recorded, singer-songwriter Harry Nilsson was drinking with some friends at a party in LA's Laurel Canyon. A song came on the turntable that aroused the attention of Nilsson. Uh, it electrified him. The line, I can't live if living without you, was just riveting to him. Nilsson thought what he was hearing was actually a Beatles song. But since he was such a Beatles worshiper, he was surprised that he'd never heard this song. The next day, Harry Nilsson returned to the side of the party and strolled through his friend's stack of record albums. Uh, he sifted through all the Beatles records in his friend's collection, and he just couldn't find this song. Harry finally realized that the song that he was obsessed with, it was recorded by Badfinger, in fact, not the Beatles. <laughs> Nilsson took the vinyl to his producer, the legendary Richard Perry, and he informed him that he wanted to cover the song for his new solo album, Nilsson Schmilson. While preparing material for Nilsson Schmilson, Harry Nilsson was not exactly a household name at that point but he won the Grammy Award for Best Contemporary Male Vocal Performance in 1970, you know, for his performance of Everybody's Talking, one of the greatest songs ever. And skipping over the ocean like a stone. On that note, as we continue to break down this classic song, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses that I always jam on here. I'm telling you, if you have a want or a need for a new pair of glasses, sunglasses, reading glasses, or the like, Click on the info button right up here, should be an eye up here, and it'll take it out and you can get to, to Zenny. They'll take care of you. They have incredible variety. Their price point, it just can't be beat. $6.95 for a complete pair of prescription frames. You choose your style. Do it today, I'm telling you. So Nelson's song, Everybody's Talking, flopped as a single off Aerial Ballet, Nelson's third album. But it had a rejuvenation when it was featured in the Oscar-winning film Midnight Cowboy, starring John Voight and Dustin Hoffman. It moved to number six on the Billboard Hot 100 and became a huge song. Everybody's talking at me. I don't hear words to say. Nielsen also penned the song One for Ariel Ballet in 68, but he didn't score a, a hit with it himself. Actually, in 69, the band Three Dog Night discovered the song, and they had a top five single with it that same year. Before he became a nationally signed artist, Nilsson was a high school dropout who kept a day job as a computer programmer at a bank center. He must have been a pretty solid employee because when the bank manager found out that he had lied about earning a high school diploma to get the programming job, Harry actually was not fired for his deception. Fellow songwriters and musicians respected Harry Nilsson's talent a great deal. It just so happened that Lennon and McCartney were big fans of Harry Nilsson. Uh, the two superstars fell in love with Nilsson's 1967 version of the Beatles song, You Can't Do That, which uh, including mention of other Beatles tunes. During a press interview in 68, Lennon stated that Nilsson was his favorite group. Everything influences everything. Nilsson's my favorite group. I guess he initially thought that what he heard was a band, not a solo artist. Lennon's public acclaim notwithstanding, the first two albums by Nilsson were actually commercial bombs. But, you know, because of the rebirth of Everybody's Talking, you know, due to the popularity of the Midnight Cowboy soundtrack, that gave RCA new hope. Everybody's talking at me. So the label upped the ante for making uh, Harry's third album, and they increased recording budgets, and that allowed Nilsson to hire producer Richard Perry, who was quickly emerging as one of the most sought after producers in the entire business. Perry agreed to produce Nilsson Schmilson on the one condition that he was granted creative control, complete creative control, which Harry did agree to. Take note of that agreement though. 
Uh, Nilsson's early demos of Without You were stark and subdued. Perry wanted to inject more power into the track, you know, more drama. He tried to convince Harry Nilsson to put some top end into his vocal, but the artist resisted. Perry recalled that one night he observed Harry working late, pounding the piano keys so hard you could feel his fingers bleeding. And uh, singing without you, the chorus as his throat was being torn apart. Harry actually grew to hate the song. He loathed it. He repeatedly voiced his disdain, and he called it a piece of pop fluff. He was adamant about his original demo being used as the finished version. It's amazing he called it pop fluff when he originally loved it, but he, but he hated it. I can't live If living is without you The producer Perry had other more grandiose ideas for Without You, including a string and French horn arrangement composed by the great Paul Buckmaster to give the track a, a climactic intensity. Keith Emerson played the piano on those early drafts of the track, but Perry came to the conclusion that Emerson's keyboards though great, were just too complicated. So they replaced him with Gary, the Dreamweaver, Wright, who executed a stately piano line that was exactly what Perry had imagined. Now the producer had to force Nielsen to take his shot with the entire orchestral arrangement. And now it's only fair. When they were working on the track in the studio with session players, Harry Nilsson constantly belittled the track to the other musicians. During playback with the production team, uh, Nilsson would ask in exasperation, does anybody even know what this song is about? How could anyone like this song? It was as if Harry Nilsson was trying to deliberately sabotage his own track. He hated it. Perry took Nilsson to a private room and begged him to stop trying to derail their efforts to create the best track that they could. The two continued to butt heads until they had a do or die moment over high tea at the Dorchester, uh, it was a five-star hotel in London. Perry said to Nilsson, you do remember when you came to me and you asked me to produce your album, my only condition was that I would have creative control. Harry Nilsson just looked at him, actually looked him directly in these eyes, and he said, yeah, well, I lied. No sooner had Nilsson made his double-crossing remark, Perry realized that they were late for the studio, you know, for the time that they had paid for already. Two of them jumped into a cab and they hurried back to uh, Trident Studio to resume the recording Without You, the song he hated. Now, for some reason, Nilsson stopped fighting his producer and he went straight into the vocal booth and he delivered the incredible once in a lifetime vocal that we hear on this final recording. It's brilliant. Perry left well enough alone, though. He decided not to quiz Nilsson about this total 180. The demo, it was never mentioned again, and there was no more conflict between uh, Harry Nilsson and, and Perry. Without any further obstruction, without you was ready for mastering in less than an hour, actually. Some Jim Keltner drum fills were added, and a rich, towering pop masterpiece was fully executed. I can't As fate would have it, Badfinger was recording in another studio in the same building as Nilsson was recording at that exact moment. Now, when Nilsson's interpretation of Without You, you know, was finished, Harry invited Ham Evans and the rest of Badfinger to hear the new version of their song. Ham and Evans immediately realized that they had made a major mistake by underestimating their own creation. It was a bittersweet moment for the duo. They felt elation and regret. Uh, Nilsson's Without You was released as the lead single from Nilsson Schmilson and became an international smash. Without You was number one in Australia, Canada, Ireland, New Zealand, uh, Japan, the Philippines, the United Kingdom, and of course the United States as well. All of them. The 1973 Grammys, the single was nominated for Record of the Year, and Nilsson Schmilson was nominated for Album of the Year. For his incredible performance, Harry Nilsson won the award for Best Male Pop Vocal. And the winner is Without You by Nilsson. <laughs> While Nilsson's Without You was reaping enormous benefits around the world, Badfinger, for their part, began to unravel. In 1975, the band was the victim of a disintegrating uh, record label and the nefarious activities of their former manager, Stan Pauly, a name in rock history that was synonymous with fraud. 
checks that the band relied to live on bounced and their album was suddenly withdrawn and rejected. And Ham was in a really bad way. He was broke. He was unable to pay the mortgage on a new house that he bought with you know, advance money that was misappropriated by Stan Pauly. Plus his girlfriend, Ann Ferguson, was expecting a baby. You know, Pete showed signs of growing mental illness, uh, exhibiting disturbing behavior, such as burning cigarettes on his hands and on his arms. On April 23rd, 1975, Ham and Evans went on a drinking bench, and after 10 shots of whiskey, Evans drove him home. Pete hanged himself in his garage studio. Now, Pete left a suicide note addressed to his girlfriend and her son, blaming Polly for his despondence. Pete Ham, he was only 27 years old. Now, Tom Evans was permanently affected by his friend's suicide. He gradually plummeted into a downward spiral of his own. Evans was in a vicious fight with his bad finger member, uh, Joey Moland, over royalties for Without You, in fact, and to make matters worse, he carried that guilt that he'd failed to stop Ham from taking his own life. Evans followed his friend and he hanged himself in 1983. He was only 36. Pete Ham, Tom Evans, and Badfinger were exploited well beyond the fringes of human decency. Their story is truly one of the most tragic of the entire rock era. If you're not familiar with the music of Peter Ham and Tom Evans, immerse yourself in their discography between 69 and 75. They created some remarkable music that you'll truly appreciate. We need to cover more of that here. Besides the classic reimagining by Harry Nilsson and Richard Perry, Bad Fingers Without You has been covered by a multitude of artists. Glenn Campbell. Oh, in your eyes, your sorrow shows. Shirley Bassey. No, I can't forget tomorrow when I think about my son. Country music star T.J. Shepard in 83. Can Air Supply does it a lot. And of course, Mariah Carey's version of 94 was a massive international smash, just like Nilsson's, went to number one again. The idea to record her remake Without You, fashioned after Nilsson's definitive version, was triggered when Mariah Carey heard the song playing in the background uh, at a restaurant in New York City. It had been many years since she had heard Without You, and the song had the same moving effect on her as it had had on her when she was a young girl. Mariah heard the song often when she was growing up. She remembered being overcome with emotion every time she heard this song on the radio. To Mariah, the song was so beautiful, it was so sad, it actually made her cry. On January 15, 1994, Harry Nilsson, the father of seven children, died of a heart attack. Nine days later, after the passing of Harry Nilsson, Mariah's Without You was released, and it too dominated the pop charts around the world. Incredibly, Mariah's cover debuted at number three on the Billboard Hot 100, and it premiered at the top of the UK singles chart as well. Went to number one on uh, four different US charts, including the Cashbox charts, AC charts, radio and records, pop, all over. It was number one all over the world. Harry Nilsson was frequently asked if his magnificent go for broke vocal and without you caused any damage to his throat. I can't give it I can't live. Sounds like he's a, a wounded animal in it. Harry joked about how straining it was to hit those top end notes that gave him hemorrhoids, but the truth is his throat was unscathed. That would all change, however, during the infamous uh, Lost Weekend with John Lennon. Lennon and Nilsson became fast friends when they were both living in L.A. from about 73 to, uh, to 75. During a late-night jam session for their collaboration on Harry's 10th studio LP, Pussycats, Lennon and Nilsson were so wasted, they foolishly began a literal screaming match to see who could well louder. Nilsson actually screamed so loud, and for so long, he ruptured a vocal cord but he actually concealed his injury from Lennon because he worried that John would halt the production. Yeah! After Lennon was uh, 
killed in 1980, Nilsson left the music scene entirely, and he devoted much of his time to uh, crusading for heightened gun control. Even though he hated playing live, Harry Nilsson seriously contemplated a comeback in the 90s, which would involve the making of a new album to be titled Lost with two S's and Found, along with a corresponding tour. He returned to the spotlight during a concert with Ringo Starr's all-star band at uh, Caesars Palace in Vegas. That was in 92. And he actually performed without you. Of course, Harry's voice didn't have that legendary three and a half octave range that he had before that screaming match with John Lennon. But the sold out audience, they ate it up. They sang along with Harry on his signature tune. It was really a great performance. The comeback of Nilsson, that was not to be though. Harry died just a few weeks after that performance at Caesar's Palace. The story behind the originators and the purveyors of Without You is for sure a tearjerker, just like the song itself. Without You is a monument to the inexplicable torment and the pining of a broken heart, the unscientific possession of mind and spirit affected by the loss of a loved one. Without You will live on, channeled by the spirits of Peter Ham, Tom Evans, Harry Nilsson, and all the other artists that have been captivated by the, the song's truly ethereal power. And thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Without You. Man, this song went through a lot. The artists that, that put it together. What are your thoughts on the different version? Which is your favorite? What are your memories of the underappreciated Badfinger and Harry Nilsson? Let's have a great discussion below and give great tribute to these artists. Uh, if you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe below because we'd love to have you as part of this process. Uh, every day, we, we count them down. We talk about the great ones. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friend.